over the age of 60, you fall and break a hip, the chance that you will die within a year is 30%. One of the things I think that the way we approach it all wrong is we go, okay, I'm not gonna eat sugar, right? Well, the minute you say, I'm not gonna do that, what are you thinking about? I like to major in the majors before the minors. So to me, you know, first thing that we should do is Hey everyone, in today's episode, we have JJ Version. JJ is a four-time New York Times bestselling author, triple board certified nutritionist and fitness expert, and a super successful entrepreneur. Our conversation with JJ varied from topics like growth mindset, supplements and diet for health and muscle building, and so much more. We had an incredibly enlightening conversation with her, and we hope that you find it inspiring and informative as well. So without further ado, JJ Version. Hey, JJ, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. First time I've done an interview with engineers. Hopefully we are not as boring as people think we are. <laughs> well, you have to show me, right? <laughs> JJ, you are a renowned expert in health and fitness, a four times New York Times bestselling author, really successful businesswoman. There has to be a level of mindset to be this successful. We wanted to ask you, where does your incredible grid come from? So I'm going to unpack it in two ways because there's grit and there's mindset. And I would say on the grit side of things, um, I, I was adopted at six weeks old. And I always, I think it's kind of an adopted kid thing where you always think you might be given back. <laughs> so you're always like, you know, trying to make sure you're taken care of. And I was very independent and, and just, you know, just always focused on, uh, from what I hear with the adopted kids are either really successful and ambitious or they're kind of in a hole somewhere. And so I, I was the ambitious side of it, always trying to make sure I was taken care of, protected and felt like I could rely on no one but myself, right? Um, but on the mindset side of things, it's really interesting. I was super fortunate. Um, in my late twenties, I had a client and at the time I was, I was in graduate school at university of Miami in sports medicine, and I was personal training and clients to pay for grad school. And I'm walking down the beach with this client and she was a self-made multimillionaire. And she said to me, she said, so what are you going to do after you get your graduate degree? And well, first of all, she goes, why are you like, why are you in school? And I said, because I want to be more successful. And she goes, oh, hmm. Now, little side note, this woman was a high school graduate who grew up in a mobile home park and was a self-made multimillionaire when I met her living on the beach in a place called Millionaire's Mile in in Fort Lauderdale, right outside of Fort Lauderdale, where you've got the beach on one side with your big mansion on and the intercoastal with your boat on the other side. Okay. And so I'm walking down the beach with her and I tell her I want to be more successful. And she goes, ah, okay, interesting. What are you going to do when you graduate? And I go, I'm going to go get my PhD. And she goes, why? And I go, because I want to be more successful. I'm like looking at her going like, duh, you know, <laughs> because you know, when you're in academics, everything is like, getting more of that. And she goes, you know, you don't need to do that to be more successful, to make more money. And here I am in my twenties. I go, it is not about the money. She goes, well, she future paced me. She goes, when you're 30, money's going to become important. And I'm just thinking this woman's nuts. Right. And at 30, she sent me a, um, a tape. Okay. Uh, you guys don't know what this is, but it's this thing. <laughs> <laughs> you put it in a VHS player. And so she sends me this thing and I'll never forget it. It was a new skin multi-level marketing tape. And it talked about trading time for money and that you needed to get out of the rat race. And it was like filmed in New York and it's crowded. And, and at the time I was trading time for money. And I remember watching this thing and I could never figure out how to, you know, like I was working 70 hours a week, going to school. I could not figure out how to get off of that train. And she sends me this thing and it was like the light bulbs went off. And I literally, I was in that USC at the time in Southern California. I drop out of my PhD program. <laughs> I sell off my stuff. I get in my car. I drive to Florida and I moved in with her. 
Oh, wow. I'm like it, to learn how to do this. And, you know, I kind of discovered multi-level marketing wasn't for me, but what you, t- what she taught, she was, what I didn't know was the top mindset trainer in new skin and new skin had gone into their, what they called interior design nutritionals. So she recruited me for the nutrition side of it. What was super cool is I ended up speaking to audiences, like huge audiences. So it got me out there really learning how to go on big stages and do teleconferences, et cetera. But what she did, she did it all by training and mindset. So the first thing she did was put a rubber band around my wrist. Now, remember, I have dropped out of a PhD program. I have sold all my stuff. I have driven to Florida and I'm going to learn how to be successful. And I'm like, teach me. And she puts these rubber bands on my wrist and she goes, every time you have a limiting belief, snap your wrist. And I'm like, I cannot believe that I just dropped out of a PhD. Like, what was I thinking? You know, I got to not be so impulsive. But over the course of the next six months, she didn't train me on business. She trained me on all of the mindset of, you know, just the power, the law of attraction, power, belief, thoughts, create. There are no victims, only volunteers. All this stuff that to this day, if you hit me, it comes out. And I I mean, it was the best thing that could have possibly ever happened. Now, had I known that's what I was signing up for, I wouldn't have signed up for it. I had to get tricked into it. But when you really look at it, like your mindset dictates everything, right? Your thoughts are powerful. They create, we know this stuff. Like you look at Napoleon Hill and all the books out there. But yet, you know, I'm a very, I'm a left brain person too, by the way. So math was my favorite subject in school. I love all the left brain stuff. So I'm always like, I want the tangible. Don't try to give me something I can't see, et cetera. So I feel very fortunate to have had that happen. And that's, that's where the mindset came from was all of that. The grit was in me. I was, I was like driven to succeed, but the mindset was the key piece because otherwise I'd still be you know, slogging away, grinding. Yeah. I think what you mentioned is we kind of reflect back as well. Like I came to the US to pursue my master's, wanted to do PhD, and then just, just to earn more money or, you know, be more successful. But that thought process is kind of flawed as well. Saying more education might not lead you to more money. Right. It's And here's the thing, I'm not discounting education at all. So I'd still be in school if I could be like, I I never understand people who say they're bored. I'm like, there's so much stuff to learn. And especially in the, the exercise physiology and nutrition and functional med, like there's, it's endless, right? However, sometimes it can be a, so I don't have to, that was one of the things she'd teach me is you'd say something and it would be just put, so I don't have to after that. And it's like, you know, I got to finish getting my degree, you know, before I can go get a job. It's like sometimes some of these things can be a cop out from going into the real world. And, you know, all the best information, if it isn't put into action, what is it? (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, you talked about mindset and belief and, you know, researching you, I have realized like everything about your life comes to this word called belief. And one of the stories that is like one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard is your story about your son. And it was because of your belief that he was able to recover like 110%. And for people who might not know the story, like, would you mind sharing that story and how it was through your belief that he was recovered? Yeah. And that belief really came from getting, you know, Kay Smith to download her mindset training into me because it was how I approached it. So when I was getting ready to publish The Virgin Diet, my sons, I I have two sons, they were 15 and 16 at the time, my younger son, Bryce, and my older son, Grant. And I was a single mom, sole financial support, and I'd gotten this big book advance for the Virgin Diet. And I'd taken the big book advance and I'd invested all into the marketing of the book. And because, you know, books are not field of dreams. You have to really get hustle to get them up, to get lift off. Mm-hmm. And so it is literally a month before the book launch really goes. And I come home and I'm out in the garage working out. My younger son runs in and says, Grant's been hit by a car and airlifted to the local hospital. Now, 
you know that no one gets airlifted for a for a broken leg and we are literally trying to call the the hospital to find out what's happening turns out he's a john doe he didn't have anything on him the only reason we knew this was my son and my ex-husband had driven by the um, accident scene and it stopped and a policeman said a boy got hit and he looked just like him because my kids looked very similar they were a year apart and so we get to the hospital they put us into a conference room and they proceed to tell us that my son has had a very serious accident. He has a torn aorta, multiple brain bleeds. He's in a deep coma and 13 fractures. And they said sometime in the next 24 hours, his aorta is going to rupture. It's hanging on by an onion skin every hour, 10% more likelihood it's going to rupture. Like they're just giving us all this news, like just, and, and they said, unless it's repaired, he's going to die sometime in the next 24 hours. But we cannot repair it here because the type of surgery he needs because of his brain bleeds is very specialized. And so you would have to be airlifted to another hospital. They go, but he'll never survive that airlift. Even if he were to survive the airlift, it's very unlikely he's going to survive that surgery. And even if he were to survive both of those, he'd be so brain damaged, it wouldn't be worth it. And I'm sitting at this conference table and with my ex-husband and my other son and my other son. Now we've taught my other son to kind of be polite, but question authority. <laughs> so <laughs> my other son's looking at this doctor saying this stuff. And he said, well, it sounds like there's maybe a 0.0125% chance he'd make it. My son now is getting his PhD in math. And the doctor says, yeah, that sounds about right with this very, you know, solemn look on his face. And my son looks at this doctor and said, that's not zero, we'll take those odds. And my ex-husband was a med mal trial attorney, which came in handy here. So he proceeded to be like, you know, say a couple words that would be like, get your butt up and go get this happening. And so we got him airlifted to the next hospital. We drove to the next hospital in the middle of the night. He survived the airlift. I walk into this next hospital. The doctor in charge had, in the middle of the night, gotten five surgical teams on board, gotten a stint that was no longer even available and had been part of a trial. He'd gotten that flown in. And he walks up to me. I find this all out later. This guy's like, you know, an angel. He walks up to me and he's like, don't worry. I got this. I do this all the time. Last week, we had someone thrown off an overpass that I fixed. This, like, this is no big deal. Let me take you to where I'm going to do the operation. I'll show it to you. He was trying to get me out of the room because, you know, I'd already seen my son on a stretcher, literally, you know, with bones sticking through his skin and glass on it. Like it was, it's one of those things you will never forget. I remember he was like on a ventilator you know, he had bones sticking through his skin. He had glass shining off of it. it. It sounded like Darth Vader. And so he's like getting me out of the room, showing me. He's like, you just wait me. You you wait over here. <laughs> we'll come and get you when it's done. Comes out a couple hours later and he goes, okay, he's he's done. He's fine. His, his aorta is totally fine. And so we are like, you know, celebrating. He goes, now, I don't know if he'll ever wake up. I'm just the plumber. And I'm like, you know, you're like, hi, low. So we're in this room at Children's at um, Harbor UCLA and standing in this corner of this room, lights coming in. He's on a ventilator. He's on all these machines that are monitoring everything, beeping for him, et cetera. And he's got literally one finger because everything now is he's had two orthopedic teams working on him. He had two rods put in his femurs, like literally everything's broken. He's got a finger. I've got the finger. <laughs> I'm holding on to it. And I'm like, Grant, you know, your name means warrior. You're going to be 110%. I'm just talking. And then I said, Grant, you know, you know, I love you so much. And and the nurse is looking at me going, you know, he's in a coma. Right. And, and I'm thinking, I know, like they can hear you when they're in a coma. And I said, your brother Bryce loves you so much. And I felt this little squeeze on my finger. And I'm like, and, but of course I also had to had no sleep. So I'm like, okay, is this, what is it? And then I went, your grandma loves you so much and nothing. And then I said, your girlfriend Mackenzie loves you. And I felt him trying to like lift my finger up off the bed. And I just, just 
this was so clear. I so knew that he, he could hear me and I just, I didn't want him to be afraid. And I just, I was like, and I don't know where any of it came from. I said, you were going to be 110%. This is going to be the best thing that ever happened to you, but you have to fight, you have mm -hmm. to fight. And he told me later, he said, you know, mom, the gray man came down and asked me if I wanted to live or die. And it was so nice over there. He goes, but I kept hearing you talk. And so I came back wow. and wow. I remember walking out of that room and it's now been 24 hours, right? <clears throat> and I'm like thinking, okay, this book is coming out and this book launch, if it doesn't go, I will be bankrupt. And I have no idea what it is going to cost to get my son to be 110%, but whatever it is, I'm going to get it. And how the heck do I do this? Like how on earth am I going to do this? And, you know, I think that's a couple important takeaways were the question was, how am I going to do this? Which, you know, you know how your brain is. My brain's solving for how am I going to do this? And the thing that popped up was, you got to be right there with him at 110%. I literally, the whole time he was in the hospital, I would not allow myself to see anything but him completely healed 110%. Like that was what was in my consciousness. And anytime anything would try to come in there, because it did, because, you know, you get really scared. <laughs> you know, there were some where there was no sign of improvement. I just was like, held that vision, held that vision, not the circumstance. And, you know, so I thought, what do I need to do? In order to do this, like a big question we have to think of for where we want to be in our life, for the goal that we want to have, how do you have to show up? Who do you need to become? And I realized that the biggest thing is I had to show up was strong because in the ICU, you cannot go in there if you have a sniffle, if you're sick, like you don't get to go because you have to walk in, you have to get your, you have to sanitize, you have to wear gloves, a mask, you have to wear a gown. So I was like, can't get sick. I'm under the most ridiculous amount of stress in my life. And I have to make sure this book goes because this book is going to pay for him. And I literally looked at my everything and I went, okay, health is number one. I'm going to prioritize making sure that I'm eating well, exercising. Like, and that's, and this is an important thing to bring up because so often people are like, I don't have time. And I'm like, you know what? <clears throat> you make time. You know, if I can eat healthy in a hospital, possibly the place has the worst food on the planet, <laughs> you know, it does, like, it does. Yeah. I know when he moved to children's hospital in LA, they had not one, but two McDonald's in the hospital, right. Just in case one was closed. So, you know, like I just prioritized that and I just kept that vision of what, what, you know, how do I help him get to be 110%? And every day I just was like, what do we need to do today? What do we need to do today? Right. And thankfully I didn't know how long it was going to take. I didn't realize that this sprint was going to turn into a marathon, but what does, difference does it make? You know, success always takes longer than we think it's going to be. That's, that is a for sure. Right. Hi everyone. If you have watched the content up until now, and if you haven't subscribed, then I request you to please subscribe to the channel. It really helps the channel grow. Thank you. Like apart from like eating healthy, like were you meditating at that time or were you doing journaling or something else to be that hundred hundred and ten percent for your son? Yeah, I will walk through what I was doing. I didn't have one of the biggest tools that I found after the fact, um, which is I um, I just, in fact, came back from a Dr. Joe Dispenza retreat. So I have been, uh, during the pandemic, crazily enough, I got very into Dr. Joe Dispenza. I've been to now, uh, gosh, eight or nine retreats now of his. So that's been fantastic. I didn't, yeah, it's been incredible. I just had dinner with him two nights ago. He's just, he is, mm -hmm. he is like a amazing human. Um, and I told him the story because I did what when he teaches you to get such a clear vision and then attach that emotion and draw it to you which is absolutely what i was doing i just didn't have the skill set i didn't have the languaging around it um that i do now but i did a lot of things to help manage this the number one thing that i did was make sure that i was getting sleep i think the first thing we tend to do when we get stressed or um pressured with things as we just steal from sleep. That's the worst thing you can do. So I literally was getting seven to eight hours of sleep every night. 
and just made it a priority. I made sure, cause I was getting over to the hospital pretty early in the morning, you know, sometime between six and 7 a.m. I usually tried to get there at six so I could be during the grand rounds and talk to the doctors. But, um, you know, that meant I was going to bed at nine, right? And I was leaving the hospital between seven and eight at night. So that was the first thing was sleep. I've always been someone, and I don't really actually do it now that I, I meditate. I used to journal a lot, but the meditation has taken place with the journaling. And it was funny because I keep thinking in the middle of meditation that I need to write things down. I'll forget them. But what I find is the more I meditate, the less I forget things. The, the important things come out of the meditation, right? They show up. Um, but the next thing I made sure I was doing was eating healthy. And I would just bring things to the hospital and then I also made sure I was working out and I found a gym half mile away. But I also, one of the biggest things I used was the hospital stairs. And I did, I found for me being stressed, um, I was doing a lot of hit training on the stairs. <laughs> you know, I was just like, I got to get this. It's like a, an animal needing to shake it off. It's better um, than stress eating. Right? <laughs> well, and stress eating at a hospital, yuck. Um, the only thing I will say is I just, I granted myself, I gave myself the coffee grace. Of, I was like, you know what? I can have as much coffee as I want during this time. And when you go to hospitals, there's like Starbucks and coffee machines everywhere. So I was like, that's, that's the only thing I'm going to say is coffee. I can have as much as I want of coffee. Um, but the other thing that I did that really helped with all of it and managing stress, and I think it's one that we don't tend to do, and especially over the last couple of years, when you look at the statistics on social isolation and how far we've come from community is I leaned in and kind of put an SOS out to my entire friend group and community at large of like, Hey, I need help, <laughs> you know, whatever you got. Yeah. Two things you mentioned. I mean, the, the hospital food is really bad in U S it's something that I experienced recently. I was, was kind of hospitalized. I fell while rock climbing and I broke my ankle mm. and I was hospitalized and I needed to put, I was super bloaty with the medicines and I wanted to put fiber in my body. And I was like, can I get something fibrous? Maybe the worst thing you have is maybe fruits. Like no, the, the only only thing closest to fruits is is we have something as apple puree. Oh gosh, <laughs> <laughs> with sugar in it, I'm sure with added sugar. They, I, I actually had to sign up. So Grant had a feeding tube at first, and then he hacked it out, and we might have helped him get it out because they were like, we can't take it out till Monday. Well, he was like. <sighs> Acting in that, acting that. But I would make him, I had a blender, I would bring in protein powder, I had a special amino acid blend, I was fish oil, I was making him special stuff and feeding him because one of the first words he said was disgusting about the hospital food. And I literally was like, don't feed him hospital food, I will bring him in things. And there was no refrigerator at the first hospital, children's hospital, entirely different. Um, but there was no refrigerator. So every day, I had to haul this stuff in and then haul out, haul anything back, which was just a pain, but so worth it. Cause I was like, I'm not, he's healing brain. I am not going to give him garbage. And they literally were like, what will he drink? I go, he's going to drink water. They wanted to give him crystal light with aspartame. I'm like, he has a brain injury with seizure activity. <laughs> like, no way are we giving him that. Then they're like, why don't we give him insure? I'm like, oh, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know? So it is, it is, I don't understand why at this point in that we still have poor nutrition in hospitals. It's just wild and bizarre. And I literally was doing all this stuff. And the nurses were like, can we just take pictures and write notes and what you're doing? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> So you 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 talk a lot about gut health, and you're one of the few people who in in the industry who talks about needing to be you know, metabolically healthy to be able to hold on to the muscle weight. So what exactly do you mean by metabolically healthy? So here's what's interesting, and you know frightening. And I, I think the biggest questions that everyone's keeps asking is why is this happening? Um, Metabolically healthy is defined by these parameters. And then I'm going to like kind of give some of my own because I think we're missing the bigger picture. But 
you know, overall, it's really a marker of how insulin sensitive you are. And the way they look at it is what's your waist circumference. And the reason they look at waist circumference is because as you become more metabolically unhealthy, you stop storing as much subcutaneous fat, fat right underneath your skin, and you start storing more around your organs, which is very dangerous. And it's not stuff that you can see like it's not so much, in fact, someone with a lot of visceral fat, you might not be able to pinch an inch at all around their waist because their stomach's so distended, but you'll know it from the waist measurement. And for me, I look at your waist to height ratio. They'd look at it and go, if you're 36 inches or higher for a woman, 40 inches or more for a man, you're metabolically unhealthy. Well, I'm sorry, I'm six feet tall. My waist measurement's going to be different than the girl that, you know, a woman that's five feet tall. That's silly. So that's one of them. Blood pressure is another one, of course, um, where you really ideally want to be 110 over 70. They say if you're one, um, 130 over 90, if either of those are high, which I think is too high. I think 110 over 70, like let's look at ideal. And that's why I'm saying this because Right now, it's 6.8% of, po- of the population in the United States that's actually metabolically healthy. The parameters are actually not what is ideal. It? 6.8, so you said? 6.8. But I think it's worse because these parameters are too, they're, they're not optimal. Then triglycerides of 150 or less, which I think you should be 75 or less. HDL of 40 or more for a woman is, or, or for a man is good. 50 or more for a woman is good. Below that is a problem. Um, and then fasting glucose um, above 100. And really, we want to see that somewhere in the 70 to 90 range. But all of that points to something called insulin resistance. And insulin resistance then, you know, is that risk factor for heart disease, for cancer, for diabetes. And so what's behind that, when you really look at what's behind that, it's a sedentary lifestyle because the first place we lose and start to restore insulin sensitivity is in the muscle. Our muscle, I like to call it our metabolic spanks. It holds everything in tighter and you know requires more energy to go through muscle protein turnover to keep it on your body. But it's also a sugar sponge where it's the first place we can restore insulin sensitivity and It gives carbohydrates a place to be stored rather than be turned into fat and stored, right? Gives them a place to be stored for energy for high intensity activities. So muscle's really the secret to all of it. And what's interesting, and you probably noticed this when you went to the hospital, we don't test for it. Like you would think if you just broke your ankle, what are you at risk for? You are at risk for losing muscle because now all of a sudden you can't do the things you were could do before. And so they'll put you on a scale, but what they really need to do is do either a DEXA scan to see your skeletal muscle mass and your fat and where that fat's located, is it visceral? Um, or at least a bioimpedance machine like an in-body, because let's say that you you have this, uh, you you break your ankle and then now all of a sudden you get sedentary. and at your age, this isn't as big of a deal, but if you broke your ankle at 50 or 60, when you're already, you're already starting to lose muscle and you've got anabolic resistance where it's harder for you to build muscle, you may never get that muscle back. Right. And that puts you at big risk for frailty as you age, for breaking a hip, for all of that. So if we're not monitoring it, how would you know? You wouldn't. So, how do you gain muscle? Because people always talk about losing weight and people go on crazy diets. And I don't think in our culture, people talk about like gaining muscles so that, you know, you can be stronger in your old age. But if someone wants to um, start working out today so they can gain muscle or start eating healthy and change their habit patterns, like how can they do that? I like to do things very simply because I think, you know, it's, if we do a ton of information, people are like, oh my gosh, too much and don't do anything. So I'm going to give you three simple things, three simple things to remember that we could, we could go deep in any one of these, but if you only do the top line of each of these, it will make a major difference. And here's the thing. We know you start to lose muscle at about age 30 and, you know, you really want to be thinking that in your teens and your twenties and your thirties and your forties, you want to be putting on as much muscle as possible so that as you start to lose it as with age, you have a higher foundation to lose from, right? 
So I started lifting weights when I was 16. That was the perfect time to start. I actually did it. We didn't even have gyms back then. I was doing, I was working out in the high school gym because there weren't health clubs with the football team because girls didn't lift weights back. Then. So, you know, that's the greatest time to start. But the second greatest time to start is now. <laughs> so I just say that because wherever you are, whether you're 20s and you, or you're 50, like, great, get started. And with the goal of putting on as much muscle as possible. And if you're a female thinking I'll get bigger, I, in 40 years of doing this, have never seen a woman who's not taking steroids get bigger. Muscles, metabolic spanks, it holds everything in tighter. So the first thing that you've got to do here in order to build muscle is actually do more than what your body's used to so that it has to recover, adapt, and get stronger. And so with muscle, that is something called hypertrophy chain training. And it's basically like doing, um, I like to do very functional exercises because I like to say that you train to get better at life, not train to get better at training, right? Who cares? And if you think at life, I'm trying to counteract a lot of what we normally do in life, which is sit and work on a computer and <clears throat> train to do things that we have to do, like pick things up, get out of the car, right? Run up the flight of stairs, especially because as we age, we lose a lot of that speed and power. So first thing they're doing big full body movements that are very functional that you can do maybe three sets of, of eight to 15. You can do anywhere from six to 30 reps, but it just takes too long. But if you did three sets of eight to 15, where by the time you get to the last couple reps, you don't ever lose your form. That means you're done. That's, that's what we call technical failure, but you get to a point where you feel like you really couldn't do an, you know, maybe you could do one or two more that's called reps in reserve. So maybe you're doing squats and you can do three sets of 12 with 150 pounds on your back and your form stays great, but you feel like, you know, but you couldn't really do much more than that. Great. And you take about a two minute break in between. So the exercises I like to look at are things that are what I call hip and thigh hinging, things like a squat or a deadlift or a step up. And then um, upper body pulling, things like pull-ups, bent over rows, real functional things. A bent over row where you are bent over, lifting a weight up and down, very functional. And then um, upper body pushing. So things like overhead press, that's to me mimicking, you know, I'm going to put my suitcase in the overhead compartment because I now travel with my mobile podcast studio and I put it in my, my carry on because it weighs so much. And I'm like, okay, this is 60 pounds. <laughs> That's got to go in the overhead. You know, this is a 60 pound overhead press or it's a snatch. It's a clean and jerk into the, into the overhead compartment. So, you know, push ups or dips or things like that. So that's resistance training. And again, it's the volume over time with consistency that helps you build muscle, but it's got to be combined with the other pillar, which is nutrition. And in that one, I like to say lift heavy things and then eat protein first, because especially when you get out of your 20s in, in your now 30s plus, in your teens and 20s, you can build muscle without needing as much protein because of your hormones, but that all starts to shift. And then you start to need the trigger of leucine and amino acid in protein of at least 2.5 to three grams in order to trigger something called mTOR to trigger muscle protein synthesis. So <clears throat> protein becomes mission critical. I say we want to eat 0.7 to one gram per pound of target body weight multiple times throughout the day. Um, so you got to have the protein and you got to have the stimulus with the muscle. You can't just eat protein and think you're going to grow your muscles and sit on the couch, but you can't just lift weights and not have, you know, what you need as the building blocks to build muscle. So you need both of those things. And then there's a third component. And I think it's kind of the forgotten component because the reality is you're not building muscle when you're at the gym doing those squats. You're building muscle when you're sleeping, when you're at home recovering. So you need the eat protein first building blocks. And I'd add creatine into that because I think it's a really important supplement for everybody. Then the resistance training stimulus and then the recovery sleep's a great one. Sauna heats a great one. So the recovery that helps you rebuild as well, because you're breaking down your muscle protein turnover is break down, build up, right? You got to do both. So you, you mentioned protein first diet. 
and having uh, 0.7 to 1 grams of protein per target body weight. So there is also, I mean, yeah, there's this protein leverage hypothesis that we we snack a lot if we are you know, thinking that the body would, would probably get protein from other sources if it's protein deprived. Uh, but there's contradictory study as well that talks that more protein causes, uh, you know, added, uh, higher levels of uric acid, which eventually causes gout or kidney stones. Well, have you have you seen people having those issues? So one of my buddies actually wrote the book, Drop Acid, all about uric acid, Dr. David Perlmutter, who's super smart. You definitely want to have him on your show. It's really actually fructose more than protein um, that is doing that. And there is in the anti-aging space and longevity space, there are like two big camps here. And there is the, you know, low protein and high protein. And you know, in the longevity with the lower protein, but they also become infertile, <laughs> you know, and frail. And they're living it like, and they're looking at rats with this. They haven't been able to prove this in humans in a very controlled environment where they're not going to break a hip. You, you know, that's the issue that I say here. If you don't have the protein that you need now, gout, again, when you really look at gout, alcohol and fructose, are probably the biggest, the biggest culprits there that are driving uric acid. Because the guy who wrote the book is actually eating more protein because he's a really good friend of mine. <laughs> so I can tell you that's not how he's, he's, he was, when he went and did the interview with me, it's fructose and alcohol are the big drivers of that. It's not, it's not protein. I think the biggest, the bigger challenge out there is trying to kind of, look at the, where are you going to get your protein from? And what do you do if you're more plant-based and how are you going to do this? Because in order to get the essential amino acids, you're going to have to work harder on it to get it. But this is why it's so super important to monitor all of these things. Like if you go through and you start monitoring your body composition, your skeletal muscle mass, your body fat, but also specifically your visceral adipose tissue. And you know, when you get a DEXA scan, you'll see bone mineral density too, but realize bone mineral density is a lagging indicator to muscle. If you've got good muscle, if you're highly unlikely, you'll have osteoporosis. Like that's an outlier. It's just like blood sugar is a lagging indicator for insulin resistant. If you're, if you're starting, you'll have insulin resistance that develops over years. And then finally you'll see issues with blood sugar because it's more tightly controlled, right? So we've got to really look at the right things here and we've got to be measuring. And that's why I think looking at body composition is so important. It's where using a CGM can be interesting and um, using an aura for sleep and, and a, using a polar for HRV. All of these things can be really helpful to put together that whole metabolic picture and to really see what's working for you. Um, because eating a lower protein diet when you're 30 plus without doing a lot of resistance training and not getting what you need in terms of leucine, you will start to see that up to 1% of muscle loss per year that starts around the age of 30. And what's scarier about that is the muscle, you're losing the muscle, which you may not ever get back, but you're losing two to 4% strength and six to 8% power. And people really, you'll, you'll see them, they just start to slow down because we're losing overall muscle, but a more of a percentage of our fast twitch muscle fibers that are that, you know, explosive, throwing, throwing something, running somewhere, running up the stairs, getting out of the way of something, which is why then people don't have that ability to move quickly and they fall and break a hip. Over the age of 60, you fall and break a hip, the chance that you will die within a year is 30%. Apart from protein, do you recommend any supplements that people should start taking? There's a couple that I love. I like to major in the majors before the minors. So to me, you know, first thing that we should do is eat protein first. Now, the research is pretty clear that people who eat protein first make better health choices, food choices overall. It's also got a higher thermic effect than the other two fuel macronutrients, fat and protein. So think of pro or fat and carbs, think of protein like a function um, macronutrient. So it takes about 20 to 30% of those calories get used up in the digestion and assimilation versus five to 10% of carbs and less than, you know, it's negligible for fat. Protein is also more satiating than those other mac macronutrients. It helps control blood sugar. 
and it improves detoxification. So I see that first with a lot of non-searchy vegetables and some fruit, especially things like berries and a big rainbow of colors for the polyphenols. And then of course, some healthy fats, some from the protein and then some used in the cooking. So maybe some ghee or some extra virgin olive oil. So that's kind of the start. Then um, I think we all need more magnesium, just not getting it enough from the diet. So magnesium's one I think is super important. Vitamin D3 plus K1 and 2, I think we all should be that, like when you look at what which labs we should get when we go to get lab tests, they're not what we're getting. Like we all should have a fasting insulin thrown in there. We want to be somewhere between two and five. We should have a vitamin D3, a 25 hydroxy vitamin D. We want to be somewhere in the, you know, 50 to 70 or 80 NGs per ml. So i Don't usually see anyone with a good vitamin D unless they're supplementing. So vitamin D is another one. We can do an omega-3 index to see where our ratios are there so that we are making sure that we're in a balanced state, not pro-inflammatory. And so for a lot of people, omega-3 supplementation is super important. Most people are not eating enough clean cold water fish. It was one of the big therapeutic things I did with my son to help him heal from his traumatic brain injury. So those are some of the ones that I love along with creatine, um, especially for women who have 70 to 80% less tissue stores of creatine than men and collagen, because we just don't eat the Colton rich foods that our ancestors did in terms of things like bone broth. Um, And ditto on the fermented foods. Like I think we need to be eating a lot more prebiotic fibers and fermented foods. But again, if you're not, you know, looking at maybe an added fiber supplement in there because we're we're really low on where we should be. Like I think 30, 35 is like the baseline. I really want people to be more around 50 grams or more a day and a variety of fibers and some prebiotic fibers that can feed the good bacteria in the gut and act like fertilizer for those probiotics. And then some fermented food. I try to get a little ferments in um, on the regular too. So those are all the different things that I'm hoping kind of come from food and then supplements to supplement them are where I go. So you, you mentioned about one 0.7 to one grams of protein per target weight. Say I'm 175, maybe 180, and, I, and I'm vegetarian. What, what are the clean sources that you recommend for vegetarian? Because I feel that's a lot of protein. Yeah, so, so that's why I have you eat it first so you don't get full. Here is the important thing for a vegetarian. I'd like you to go to the higher end. If you're looking to recomp your body, which is put on muscle while losing fat, go to the higher end. And so as a vegetarian, you can get, you know, you can do dairy and eggs, which is helpful. You just have to make sure you don't have a food intolerance to them because you're going to be relying so heavily on them. For vegans and vegetarians, I think that the best thing that you can do is have a little insurance policy. It might be called a hack or a cheat, but it is essential amino acids. And what I would do is get a high quality essential amino acid blend, and I would have it with your morning and evening meals to make sure because, you know, dairy and eggs are complete. You're going to get a really good balance of essential amino acids. When you start to get into the plant sources, you've got issues with digestibility and bioavailability, and the balance of essential amino acids is not the same. And so you can cheat that by also taking an essential amino acid supplement alongside it. Um, So what I would do with that is, and then if you are a vegetarian, you know, you also have to look at things like vitamin D. Because you'll, you know, as a vegetarian, are you willing to supplement with D3? Because it's not going to be normally a plant source. There are some out there. Same with algae. Like you do an omega-3, you would do it from algae. Um, You definitely want to do creatine because you will not get it because it's fish and meat, right? So that's a definite important thing. And you can do this as a vegan or a vegetarian. You just are going to have to use supplements and be a little bit of a nutritional biochemist. Like you cannot mess around with this. You have to be really aware of what you're doing. It's even harder as a vegan, like super hard, because when you look at it, let's look at quinoa, for example, the same amount of protein in quinoa as a chicken breast is 200 calories versus 900 calories. But then when you look at leucine, in order to get to the leucine levels in quinoa, you get to 1200 calories. That's just one meal. 
how the heck do you get like, you know, and for a woman, I don't know how you would do that. If the average woman's eating maybe 2000 calories a day, like, what are you going to do there? You're, you've maxed out your calories before you've even really gotten started. So I use protein powders there to help. Like, I think that's an easy way to do it for a, um, if you are eating dairy, Greek style yogurt and whey protein can be great, but you do need to make sure that you haven't developed a food intolerance because when I did the virgin diet, it was because I was looking at a lot of food sensitivity testing. And when you start to get a more permeable gut known as leaky gut, it can happen due to gluten. It can happen due to toxins. It can happen due to stress. It can happen due to pain medications. It can happen due to fructose. Um, your gut gets more permeable and, and the foods, you know, right below your small intestine is, which is one layer is your immune system. These, these foods sneak into the immune system because the gut's more permeable than it should be. And your body launches an immune attack and starts to create low grade inflammation and all sorts of symptoms, gas and bloating, joint pain, headaches, fatigue, skin issues, uh, weight loss resistance. You start to crave those foods because your body now has these antibodies lying in wait for the food to come in. And dairy and eggs were the top of the, the ones that I saw, the most common. And so it tends to be the foods you eat every single day. And that's one of the challenges with vegetarianism is you're not gonna have as big of a rotation. So dairy and eggs were the first ones. Corn, soy, peanuts were the next level. Gluten causes, um, you know, is a big cause of leaky gut because it triggers the release of zonulin, which is this, you know, this, um, this protein that's going to make your gut become more leaky and gluten in the United States is basically glyphosate. So you're going to get toxic issues too. Same with corn, but that's the other thing is, are you eating the same foods all the time? You could look at doing things like, you know, a protein powder that you add into it, but that you have to really look because it's, you know, your sources tend to come along with carbs or fat. And in order for you to really make sure you're getting what you need, you want to use an app. I like the chrono chronometer app so that you can track to ensure that you're getting the protein levels you need. But then I would also use essential amino acids to make sure that you are getting what you need in terms of essential aminos, especially in the morning and evening meals, because morning you are turning on muscle protein synthesis, evening you're turning it on and making sure you've got it going because during the night you'll start to get catabolic. Another topic I really wanted to talk to you about was sugar. Uh, when I first came to America like 15 years ago, I went to high school here and I went to a Catholic high school. So we had to buy our lunch and the cheapest thing in our lunch menu was French fries with cheese on top and soda. And within like a few months, I gained probably like 20 pounds. Wow. You could have been your own little like reality show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Straight from Nepal to New York. But after gaining weight, I was like, oh, I have to lose weight. So I started eating like fat-free yogurts or juice from supermarket and that didn't help either. Mm -hmm. And later on, I realized mm -hmm. that everything we eat has sugar especially if we get that in a supermarket. And I feel like a lot of people don't have that understanding that everything you are consuming that's processed has some amount of sugar. So if someone wants to lead a healthy lifestyle and want to avoid sugar, like how can they go about changing that lifestyle? So, you know, one of the big challenges with the, the processed food, with the ultra processed food is it's, generally sugar and fat and that sh and they really drive your appetite it is the research shows that people who eat more of that tend to eat about 500 calories more a day and even worse than that they have a lower thermic effect of that food because the protein is the higher thermic effect and you mentioned earlier that protein leverage hypothesis where it might have like you know, the taste of protein, but it doesn't have it in it. So it drives you to overeat to get enough of those amino acids. So it's just like a bad, bad combo. Now, <clears throat> when you've started to eat like that, your body starts to get used to that. And now you start to get insulin resistant and your body isn't able to use stored fat as well. And so you start to crave that sugar and you start to need that sugar in order to keep your energy up. So you got to reverse that situation. 
One of the things that helps you reverse that situation is doing resistance training because you can start to just restore insulin sensitivity. The next thing you can do is walking after your meals because it gets your blood sugar, lowers your blood sugar response. The next thing you do is really focus on eating protein first. It's going to lower the blood sugar response, but it's also going to help stop the cravings and help start you feeling full. And then combine that with high fiber. That would be things like non-starchy vegetables, slow, low carbs like legumes and a little bit of fruit. So things that can slow it down. That's like the biggest way to really help you do it. Cause a lot of these cravings I find are when people are not eating enough protein, they are getting the cravings. But realize those foods were engineered to not, to make you hungry, to not be satisfying, to make you want more and more and more of them. And then that combined with insulin resistance is just that nightmare. That's that metabolic, where you become metabolically unhealthy. And it's wild that you move to the US and can get like, that's just, you're a poster child of what happens here, right? It's just ridiculous and crazy. So <clears throat> one of the things I think that the way we approach it all wrong is we go, okay, I'm not gonna eat sugar right? Well, the minute you say, I'm not going to do that, what are you thinking about? Oh, that's all you're thinking about. Like, like I have learned over the years, cause I've literally been on every diet. I mean, I was like in high school, I was like, I, you know, I need to go on a diet because girls think they need to go on a diet. It's ridiculous. Um, whatever I was going to not eat is all I wanted to eat. So that's why I think instead of doing that, which is just set up such a setup and first go, what if all I started to do, because the research is clear on this, if you're eating the same amount of calories every day, but you took some of those calories away from sugar and you ate protein, you'll actually start to lose weight. And then you'll probably start to cut your calories because you'll be, you will be less hungry and you won't have those cravings. So instead of looking at what you're not going to do, instead start to put some of the good things in first because that will start to remove some of that. And you will also take all this weird diet mentality of a good day and bad day and all that crap that really just sets us up for really yo-yo dieting and, and damaging our metabolism, right? I, mean, I grew up in a low income like neighborhood and uh, you know the quality of food that we were getting was very different. So, and I feel like that level of education is not as much in that community. And also like there are not enough um, education material to like learn, especially not like 15 years ago. Well, and even now, <clears throat> just like you asked the question about uric acid, it is the most, first of all, diets in the United States are like religions. It is the most controversial, bizarre thing. You look on social media and you're like, what is going on here? Yeah, the, the fights and, and I see what I see people doing on social media that makes it hard for all of us is they're majoring in the minors never eat X, X is going to do blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, could we first focus on here's what you should start here, start eating this, like start making this first change. What if your first change that you said was, okay, I'm going to first really focus on getting optimal protein in every day. Cool. That might take a bit. I mean, I had one woman, I gave her some things to do. She goes, I only did 25% of what you asked me to do. And I lost 25 pounds. I go, what'd you do? She said, I started eating that protein first. Like you talked about, I go, cool. I go, so once we get that one nailed, now the research shows people who do that tend to make better food choices overall, but then we could start with, okay, let's now let's get some vegetables in, you know, and nowhere in here have I said, stop eating that. I just said, let's start this. Then let's add this. Okay, let's start some resistance training. You know, it's like if we just start to build and stack those, that habit stacking, everything shifts. It just becomes so much easier. And you're not in the diet wars of like, oh my gosh, don't eat these plants. They're going to give lectins, you know? And then you're like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Your books, you know, they are fantastic. They impact sugar and the, the virgin diet. I like the idea of losing weight by just changing the lifestyle as opposed to dieting. Um, but there are a lot of people like me who, who struggle to gain weight. And the biggest problem is so if, if, if for me, if I, end, if I eat junk or junk food or if I don't work out for a few days, like say I fell down and I was not able to work out, I lose muscle mass really fast. Have you come across people like that? Yeah, well, so this is the concern I would have with you as a vegetarian and why I'd say, number one, I would love to see you on creatine. Right now with healing, creatine and collagen, um, super important and some really good 
um, a great bone support formula with and vitamin D and K1 and 2. Super, all super important um, for healing from this, okay? And you just have to make sure, and this is where I want you to use a, an app. And I think, you know, the first thing to do with a food tracking app is use it as an audit to really just right now, if you just for a week said, I'm just going to write down everything I eat. I'm going to use a food scale so that I can be absolutely accurate because we totally misrepresent. If we're, if we're trying to do it by eyeballing it, forget it. You have to wait. I travel with a food scale. So you're doing that and you're tracking it so you can really see actually what are you getting? What am I getting at each meal? Am I hitting at least 30 grams of protein each meal? I'd say 40 was better. Am I getting at least 100 grams overall each day? What am I getting? And I would start you there because my concern is with you is like, are you actually getting enough of what you need? And make sure you like and add in that creatine, super important. And for people who want to gain weight, because I've, I've had to work with people you know, who've had to gain weight for films and, and it's, it's funny in Hollywood, so I'll have to gain weight, but you don't want them like to do it unhealthy. So, you know, when you look at what you need to gain weight, it's not that much because you don't want to gain weight and gain visceral adipose tissue. You want to gain healthy weight. So you just need to have, you know, a little more calories than you're, than you can expend, right? Get the protein that you need, go on the higher end of that, at least one gram per pound of target body weight, and then just be a little bit over what you need, but make sure you're doing resistance training because you can still work out everything else, right? You've got, you know, you, you, there's a whole lot you can do. I, I've had to resistance train through all sorts of different things. Like I'm always like, which things can I work? You know, so make sure you're doing that too, so that you're building muscle. And one of the things we do when we want to focus on building muscle specifically is we'll put in another, like, you know, it doesn't need to be much two, 300 calories um, a day to do this. Right. So that you're not putting on a bunch of fat too. Mm. That's a good advice. We'll, we'll give that a shot for sure. First off is start tracking. Yes. Tra track that is one of the most amazing things. And get yourself a bioimpedance scale. They're not as accurate as a DEXA. I like people to do a DEXA and then get their bioimpedance scale and, and correlate it. They're, you're just using it for the trend. And they've, they're great now because they're Bluetooth and they can go and just give you the trend. I will tell you the DEXA. I have a very expensive bioimpedance machine at home, but I, I use the Bluetooth one because it just tracks on my phone. It is it is 10% different than the DEXA, but I don't care about that. I'm just looking to make sure that, you know, I'm not seeing any big weird things happen. Like, you know, all of a sudden over two weeks, I've lost, you know, I've lost a pound of muscle or something rotten, right? What's the name of the scale? The one I think is the best home use one is something called Oxaline Pro. O-X-I-L-I-N-E Pro. And you just get a little app. And the other one is something called Renfo, R-E-N-P-H-O. That one's cool because they also have a Bluetooth tape measure. So you can use the tape measure and you have a little app and it will do both your measurements once a week. I think you should do waist and hip. And then it will do your weight every day in bioimpedance. What is the app for recording your food? Chronometer, C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R. And uh, for people who want to learn more about you and your work, like where should they find you? So I have a free protein challenge where I just, that's all we do. It's like, let's track and eat more protein. And that is at jjvirgin.com forward slash protein first. Um, and again, I like to focus on one thing at a time that makes a big difference, like major in the majors. So that's the first thing. And that'll, that'll get you into my whole world. Yeah. We just interviewed the uh, writer of one thing last week. So. I love that book. I'm like, I feel like all every entrepreneur kind of needs to read that book. Like they need to carry it around because it is the most challenging thing of all is just to, to do that. And every time you read it, you go, yeah, when I focus on one thing, I'm way more successful. But the first thing you try to do is like add more things, you know, it's like, yeah, like you mentioned, like master one habit and then stack more habits on top of it. Right. And that's why the ones that I mentioned actually make big differences because we all want to see something. You know, there's nothing worse than like going, I did this and nothing happened. But all of these things actually make really positive changes fairly quickly. Shishu, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. It was, it was fantastic you talking welcome. to you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast till now. I hope it added value in your life. And if it did, please subscribe to our channel. It will help us grow and bring more incredible guests. Thank you.